Good afternoon, everyone. I'll invite you to take your seats and settle yourself into the here and now. My name is Caitlin Rathwell, and I will have the pleasure of facilitating the panel this afternoon and our discussion that will come after it. So we are joined here by four esteemed panelists. I believe one may be joining online. We have Melanie Walker, who's joining us from the Métis Nation of British Columbia. Brandon McLeod from the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. Mike Perry, joining from the Institute for Climate Leaders. And Will David from Inuit Tapirit Kanati. Kanatami, ITK. So for our session today, <laughs> focused on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Adopted in 2007, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recognizes the rights of Indigenous Peoples, safeguarding their distinct cultures, languages, and ways of life. This panel explores the connections between UNDRIP and the SDGs, uncovering how the principles of Indigenous rights and sustainable development are intrinsically linked and mutually reinforcing. And so how this is going to work is that the MNC has curated some questions for our panelists, which they received in advance. And so we'll have the opportunity to explore these questions together. And although I'm sure each one of them could speak for 40 minutes on each of the questions, I'll ask them when it's their turn to try and limit their answers to one or two key points that they want to make, just to create enough space and a little bit more of a conversational experience for us. Following these curated questions, we'll have 15 minutes to do a Q&A with the folks here in the room. So I'd encourage you, perhaps you want to keep a notepad out if some ideas or questions come up, take a note of them and we'll be happy to explore them together at the, towards the end of the session. Good. So. First question that I have, and um, so the first question we'll start with, what are some of the challenges in effectively integrating indigenous rights into national and international efforts to advance UN mechanisms such as the Sustainable Development Goals? Oh, so sorry, excuse me, <laughs> of course. First thing we're going to do is allow each one of the panelists to introduce themselves, let us know where they're coming from, and why they're passionate about this topic. Please go ahead. Yeah, Brandon, why don't you start? Sure, can you hear me? Am I, uh, am I coming through in there? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Brandon McLeod. I'm general counsel at the Métis Nation Saskatchewan, um, formerly director of justice and legislative affairs uh, at the Métis National Council. Um, my background in, in UNDRIP and then these topics, I think, really started in maybe 2020 um, when I was part of the technical and legal team for the MNC. Uh, during the development of C-15, which is the Federal UNDRIP Implementation Act, uh, and then carried through um, as the technical lead for the MNC's um, team co-developing the action plan. Um, so I've been steeped in, in a lot of these questions and with the panelists as well for the past several years, and so it's, it's good to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, MNC for having me, of course, and uh, Kate Gillis and Daniel Knuff, Avery Steed, and, and President Karen for putting this together. And I'm sure many others put in work as well, uh, and uh, my panelists as well. So I'll just uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Over to you, Melanie. Hi there. Uh, so my name is Melanie Walker. 
Um, I'm with Métis Nation British Columbia. I'm director of Métis Rights Negotiations and Justice. So I oversee the Ministry of Rights and the Ministry of Justice uh, for MNBC. Um, and yeah, I've worked with Will and Mike and Brandon quite a lot over the past year and a half um, at various tables, uh, negotiation tables with Canada, especially around UNDRIP. Um, my passion really comes from um, fighting for Indigenous rights um, in this work. Um, I have done a lot of international work, um, especially with the United Nations. Um, so I've done some work with UN Women, um, United Nations Association of Canada, um, the UN Refugee Agency, and UNDP, um, all working on different Indigenous rights projects. Um, and then at some point I decided I wanted to come home and bring that fight um, back to Canada. Um, so that's really where my passion comes from. And thank you to uh, MNC for inviting me to the panel. Um, and thank you to my leadership for having the trust in me to be up here representing MNBC today. Thank you. Will? Sure. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, William David. Uh, I'm a member of Mohawk Savak Wazasne, but I work for uh, Inuit Tepari Kanatami as the uh, Director of Legal Affairs. Um, I'll, I'll just speak a little bit about ITK just because I'm not confident or sure that everybody is fully aware but, um, about who we are. Um, we're a national representative institution for, for Inuit in Canada, um, at least at the, the national level. Um, we seek to advance Inuit self-determination um, predominantly through unity. Um, Inuit Nunanga is a fairly large region within Canada. It's about 40% of Canada's land mass. It's over 72% of Canada's coastlines. It's a very, very big area. Um, although about 70,000 Inuit, so a comparatively small population. Um, in this work, one of the things that really drives me and drives ITK is really using the Declaration of Sustainable Development Goals as levers to deal with the um, at times crushing levels of inequality uh, between Inuit and other Canadians, between Inuit and Inuit and the rest of Canada, um, and between Inuit and other Canadians that live within the Inuit homeland uh, of Inuit and Inuit. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that and spare you uh, the numerous statistics on inequalities that I have. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Tanshi, everyone, kia. I'm Mike Perry, and it's so wonderful to be here today and be among my Métis family and, and friends again. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation and to be part of the panel, working together again with Brandon, Will, and Mel. Um, uh, what I do by day, I'm the executive director of the Institute for Change Leaders, which is a national training and education um, institute based in Toronto, but nationwide. And until very recently, I was the legal advisor for Métis National Council. Uh, which was wonderful, wonderful work. And again, great to see so many familiar faces. Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude so we can have more. I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, and to hear the questions that you may have. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And why don't you actually, Mike, take the mic first. I'll repeat the question. Uh, so we're going to start with this very broad question, and I'm really interested to hear what the panelists have to say here. What are some of the challenges in effectively integrating Indigenous rights into national and international efforts to advance UN mechanisms, such as the SDGs? Okay, well, thanks for the question. And I think I'd start by looking, of course, at the SGDs. And when you look at the list of the 17, what's there? Right? We have things like no poverty, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean drinking water, decent work and economic growth, life on land. Any of these sounding familiar to anyone in terms of the lives of Métis people, right? Um, and so when I saw the question, I was really thinking about, okay, national implementation, national effectiveness here in Canada of the SGDs. And I couldn't help keep coming back to Canada's action plan to implement UNDRIP and the provisions that are in this action plan, which was adopted um, and tabled in the House of Commons uh, back in June. Um, because, you know, if you look through the shared priorities, for example, uh, the action plan, uh, you know, action plan measure 75 talks about Canada's commitment to ensuring the unique differences of how poverty is experienced by First Nations, Inuit and Métis people are recognized in the design uh, and delivery of policies and programs. APM 
89 talks about mental health promotion and health and well-being uh, for Indigenous people. And I have to use the forum, of course, to say that uh, the future of uh, Métis health needs to include Métis extended health benefits granted by the Government of Canada in any Indigenous health legislation. Um, APM 102, for example, talks about Canada's commitment to use the necessary efforts to support access to post-secondary education and skills training. And APM 103 talks about self-determination in the context of Indigenous children through the co-development of the um, Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework. So I think you can see a lot of parallels between the SGDs internationally as an instrument and the action plan that was just negotiated the past year or two and then adopted by Parliament uh, last June. Um, there's also a Métis-specific chapter in the action plan uh, that was um, negotiated, talking about, for example, Action Plan Measure 11, talks about economic, health, and education rights. Um, action Plan to Measure 12, working to get together and have the, inst the indicators of poverty um, and well-being worked out. And Action Plan Measure 5, talking ensuring that policies and practices to implement the Family Services Act um, recognize, for us, the inherent Métis right to self-determination and the rights of children, youth, and their families. Again, so I couldn't help but notice, and I'm sure it's not no mystery, the alignment, right? Not just in the text, but in the spirit, in the uh, actual um, mandating of these measures. I mean, I'm sure you get the point. Uh, so I'd invite you to take a look at the action plan in the context of the SGDs uh, as well at some point. So really, what I wanted to say, and I'll, I'll only leave a couple more minutes on this if that's okay. Um, you know, exactly, so thank you for that segue. The challenges and barriers. So again, there's a bigger picture here, but one barrier I find, and one could say, is the barrier to advancing and implementing the SGDs here in Canada, especially for Métis people. I mean, Métis poverty rate is 14 plus percent, twice the, the national average. So you see that there's work to do. We know that. We know that from all our work and the people that we know. And so, if you look at the Canada's action plan, the barriers to the action plan, one could say, are some of the barriers to implementing the SGDs. And perhaps the SGDs and their implementation and their status through an international instrument can be leveraged with Canada to hasten and ensure implementation of the measures that I just mentioned in the action plan. Um, a few barriers, I'll just go again very briefly and end up with the the most significant, I think. Um, one barrier is commitment and resolve. We need a strong commitment by both Canada and, of course, the Métis Nation. A lot was put into the action plan, a lot. And, um, you know, now I have to ask, is there institutional fatigue? There seemed to be a lot of momentum to get the action plan negotiated, and then there seems lately to be some disengagement, um, some empty spaces on the Zoom calls, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, some uh, repeated need for authorities uh, to, to go with very what we would consider very clear um, measures to implement with pre-existing authority. There's a looming election, we get that, um, possible change of government, and so I think one of the barriers is making sure that we do what we need to do to be at the table with Canada and creep, keep up that great momentum that really put the action plan together, and there were so many great moments of really good work together. Uh, I mentioned Another barrier to implementing the SGD-like, shall we say, uh, goals and commitments by Canada in the action plan um, has got to be, again, this perceived need uh, that I've detected before about needing additional authorities. Uh, this action plan was approved by Cabinet twice and then tabled in Parliament. So to be able to, as a Métis nation, work and build momentum and uh, comfort and trust in our relationships think is key to overcoming that barrier. Um, and then continued ongoing, and I'll wrap up here, is um, the ongoing barrier is um, the perception of Indigenous people and Métis governments as stakeholders, right? And uh, we're not stakeholders, we're equal parties from our historical and constitutional uh, part and relationship with Canada in the constitutional order. So as equal parties, what does that mean for implementation? Well, what implementation isn't, it's a hard one, because we're all on this new journey together. 
What does co-development look like? What's uh, you know, cooperation and collaboration, consultation and collaboration? What are those? What do they look like? Well, in my experience, we have a list of what they don't look like, what they're not. They're not stakeholder consultation business as usual. Um, they're not internet surveys or traditional advisory groups or the usual kind of back and forth on drafts um, seeking input. What it does look like, so far from what I can tell, is that VT governments need to be there from the start of the drafting processes, the very first start, even to determine whether our interests and rights are implicated in the determination phase. Um, it also looks like co-developing meeting agendas, co-developing events, what they'll look like um, from the start, again, having meaningful, meaningful cooperation in drafting law and policy. And I'll leave cabinet privilege for another day. But, um, sorry, that was a really nerdy lawyer joke. Right, I, I, yeah, there are a few, yeah, I know, right, yeah. So, um, but I think the most important too, the barrier, if we're gonna implement the SGDs and how they're reflected in the action plan, implementation for the action plan, is to ensure that we proceed with the nation to nation, government to government approach in implementing the action plan. And that governments are approached when Métis views are sought or data or participation of our experts and our knowledge keepers. So to me, those are some of the barriers. I couldn't help but equate the SGDs with the action plan. And so therefore, some of the barriers may be the same as the barriers mm -hmm. encountered to implement the action plan. And um, well, that's really all I have to say on that. Uh, you know, by knowing these barriers and taking action, I think we can really realize you know, the promise of UNDRIP and the SGDs in the lives of Métis people. So thank you, thanks for the question. Fantastic, thank you so much, Mike, for that answer and for also introducing some of the ways that we can overcome those barriers and those challenges. Uh, I'm gonna pass it to Brandon on the line. Uh, what are your thoughts on this question? Sure, thanks. Uh, and I, I like the way Mark, Mike articulated some of that and so I'm not gonna Recanvas it, but I'll add a couple points. Um, I think off the top, when we look at integrating indigenous rights into these efforts and what it means, um, it's not a list of rights that we try and incorporate into some some ongoing effort. One of the key components of, of indigenous rights, as affirmed in, in UNDRIP, is our participate our right to participation in decision making, and so that allows us to ensure that these things are being integrated uh, into efforts, and, and it's not just. Uh, a list of, of things that we're not at the table. Part of, part of integrating our rights means that we're at the table for decision making. Um, and I can't help but notice in, in the structure of the UN and, and so on, um, we're just not there. Uh, and I understand there's a panel on enhanced participation and there's a lot of work going on in, in that field. Um, I, like I, think, I think that's a really key barrier. Um, we're not a member nation state. Uh, and so for some of these international multilateral efforts, um, it's very difficult to vindicate our participation rights if, if we're not at that status. And I understand there's lots of, of interesting and good work going on in that area. And so maybe I'll leave um, discussion of that, further discussion to, to those experts. Um, but I also look at SDG, SDG 17, um, which talks about strengthening implementation and partnership and, and multilateral stakeholder relationships and, and all that kind of language. Um, and I can't help but think, like Mike just said, that's not really a government-to-government -government approach. Um, it's something, it seems to be a way to kind of solve for the problems of, of bringing in Indigenous nations into the process, but it's not, it's not at the level, I would argue, as, as what's been affirmed in UNDRIP. Uh, and so that's another barrier, and I think a, kind of a related challenge. Um, I think I'll make one more, I think more of a broad point, which is I think all of this reflects one of the central challenges of, of government and planning in general, which is the tendency of, of these centralized authorities, um, national governments, or if you think of the UN as like the ultimate high level multilateral decision making forum, um, there's a tendency to, to seat decision making in these really high level abstract concepts and, and aggregated data. You don't have that on the ground local knowledge. Um, 
and that's what there's so much in Andrew affirming and protecting our ability to have own our knowledge and to transmit it and to maintain it. <clears throat> sorry maintain it um, and fitting that into the the general framework of of implementing something as broad and as abstract and as sort of high level as the SDGs I think is is, a, is quite a barrier um, and there are ways to overcome that I think um, but I think that gets into the next question a little bit so maybe I'll hold off on on those answers um, until then so I'll, I'll see rest of my time to Will and Mel uh, so thank you Thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> I'll pass it over to Melanie now for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, this, this, you can hear me, yeah? I can't tell when you're right in front of it. <laughs> um, so I think I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about, so how the ch challenges in effectively integrating indigenous rights within the mechanisms um, are also a little bit in the fault of the mechanisms themselves. Um, and so I, I'm a fan of the United Nations. I've worked for them. I'll work for them again, probably. Um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done with, within those mechanisms. Um, so the sustainable development goals, which I also like to remind people, used to be the Millennial Development Goals, the MDGs. And so they were kind of relabeled. Um, but they, and we're, we're not gonna achieve the SDGs, but we also didn't achieve the MDGs. So, um, so it's kind of a double hit, like we've extra, like double not achieved the SDGs. Um, they're, they're still sustainable development goals. They still come from the notion that, uh, the Western notion that development is progress, um, which indigenous populations um, primarily, from my experience, um, define very differently from, from that Western notion of development. Um, it's, it's not skyscrapers and, and cars. Um, it's not this kind of more capitalist notion. It's, it's a universal, holistic, mother nature notion of looking at everything as one. Um, so I think that's an important piece to, to discuss when talking about UN mechanisms and, and where um, the concept comes from. It, it still is that Western notion. Um, and so if you are then integrating indigenous rights, that again, the mechanism of, and, and someone mentioned this in the morning panel, um, we, it's not really a discussion of integrating indigenous rights because then again, the power balance or the power dynamic is still with that Western notion um, versus taking an indigenous holistic view and then integrating, no one ever says let's lead with the indigenous view and let's integrate Western or let's change Western. Um, and, and that would really be flipping the system you know, upside down. Um, we hear Naomi Klein sometimes talk about that, like the only thing we can do to make the change is to literally take the system and just put it upside down and just completely shake it up. Um, otherwise, real change may not occur. Um, so just that concept of the challenges, I think, are actually looking at the mechanisms and the structures um, and the way that we, we talk about it. Even just saying integrating Indigenous rights, that's colonial rhetoric. Um, that's powerful colonial rhetoric um, because the, the power dynamic in that is from a Western notion, from a Western power dynamic. Um, within that, the... I think also talking about UNDRIP a little bit, as my colleagues did when, for this particular question, um, I also like to, to bring up that even though UNDRIP is a wonderful mechanism um, and it's discussed as something semi-new, uh, even though we've been working on it for uh, over a decade, a couple decades now, um, it's, it's actually not new. Um, everything in UNDRIP in the declaration has been advocated for and fought for by indigenous populations um, since colonialism. So I think that's also a really important piece is that when we're talking about the advocacy or the fight to um, have a lead with indigenous rights, it's not, it's not a modern notion. It's, it's something that has been occurring since, since colonialism. It hasn't been occurring since 07 when we started to talk about UNDRIP. And UNDRIP isn't new. Um, I do find it interesting though that it took 
an international organization the size of the United Nations to actually, after even a decade of trying to get countries to sign on, to talk about Indigenous rights in the way that they are occurring today. Uh, which is a bit of a, also a challenge in and of itself. It shouldn't have taken the UN to, to put forward UNDRIP to have governments, including the government of Canada, actually sit up and listen to Indigenous populations. Um, do I still should keep going? I'm watching my time. Um, in terms of some, I, I, so those are some of the challenges. I can, I'll talk a little bit now about like barriers to overcome so I can kind of shift a little bit. Um, is I really find within these mechanisms because of their power dynamic, because of their Western notion, um, especially with UNDRIP, and especially with the way that Canada um, has, has put forward the action plan, in, in my opinion, we're still not realizing UNDRIP because the decision maker is still Canada, for example. Um, and until the decision maker is not the government in power, in control, you have not realized free prior and informed consent. So I think that's an important piece, is that decision making. There's a lot of great work um, that, you know, my colleagues and I did um, uh, with other co colleagues of ours from other governing members, did some great work with Canada, see some of the folks in the audience that we did the great work with uh, on the UNDA Action Plan, but the decision making still, still is is with Canada. And you, you see that with other countries. I've worked on um, UNDRIP and with, um, in Guyana, I was doing a, a land titling project where we were demarcating uh, indigenous land back to the, to the Toshaos, or chief is what would be the equivalent here in Canada. Um, and and they, they're a country that signed on to UNDRIP. Um, but, and when you're on the land, you're, you're working on the demarcation with, with the um, indigenous knowledge holders, um, and then, you know, the whole dynamic of forestry and mining industry is there, but that's a whole other panel. Um, but just the, the idea of the decision making, it, that even though you're on the ground, you have the knowledge that has been around since time immemorial um, go into the work, it still goes to the government in control to make that final decision. Um, and so you do not just see that in Canada, but you really see that on a global perspective. Um, the decision maker is still the colonial government that's in, in power. And so the, the, that's really the biggest barrier. Uh, so to overcome that, we have to incorporate free prior informed consent. We have to change the concept of who the decision maker is and how decisions are made and bring in concepts of that saying no is okay, that saying we must wait is okay, um, to, to just look at things and shift them Quite, quite a bit. I think, yeah, I'll wrap up there. Wow, thank you very much, Melanie. I love how you brought us, you brought the lens right out to challenge and look through a power lens at these bigger mechanisms. Uh, pass it over to you, Will, for your thoughts on that question. Sure. Um, so I basically have, um, I hope, uh, only two, two points with like 11 sub points on each one. Um, the, the first one is just, uh, again, a little bit of context for, from ITK's perspective, is uh, our, our governing members, if you will, the members of ITK are the Inuviala Regional Corporation, uh, Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated, uh, Makivik Corporation, and the Nanatsivut government. Each of those treaty organizations is in modern treaty with Canada. There are five modern treaties that the Inuit are signatories to in Canada negotiated over decades and full of very specific obligations um, that, that outline basically the obligations and rights of Canada, uh, Inuit and some national jurisdictions respectively. Um, that took a long time to do. Um, and in a constitutional democracy like Canada, constitutional rights are important, they matter. Nevertheless, um, the challenges associated with implementation of those rights really informs um, ITK's view, at least, about um, how to deal with rights and rights discourse generally. Uh, more specifically to note that simply because an instrument exists um, and is a rights-bearing instrument, um, there's a lot of work to be done on implementation. In other words, you can't ever assume that rights themselves self-execute. 
And sometimes the pathway for implementation is as challenging as the pathway for the normative development. Why is that important? It's important because my colleagues stated the origination of sustainable development goals themselves are, are goals. They're, they're not necessarily themselves rights. Um, they're goals to reduce inequality um, both within and, and between um, nation states. When we look at the declaration, uh, again, as ITK, what we see is an instrument that's rights-bearing, um, negotiated very carefully over decades, um, and negotiated in a way to ensure that it's consistent. So how does, for instance, the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child apply to indigenous peoples? The answer is consolidated into the declaration itself. And that's important because, so far as we're concerned, that means that's a rights-bearing document. Um, one of the challenges that we have is, as one would expect with any other rights, is how those rights are understood and implemented in a broader context. Um, and so that really does inform sort of the um, examination of the sustainable development goals. When the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples occurred in 2014, there was a system-wide action plan that came out of that. The UN system-wide action plan did have a specific plank in it about ensuring some degree of convergence between indigenous rights and sustainable development goals. But the actions that the UN articulated underneath that weren't necessarily specific to rights, nor were they particularly strong, which means there's really not a lot of opportunity for indigenous peoples to use um, rights as a lever to influence international policy discourse uh, and leaves the, the risk that there are substantial gaps in the implementation of the SDGs. Um, at least vis-a-vis -vis the declaration. Um, so that's just one set of points about rights that, that I'll park for now. The other set of points actually also relates to the declaration and the goals is the diversity among and between indigenous peoples. Inuit are, are one people within Canada. There are Inuit in Greenland, the United States, and Russia as well, all one people. Just within Canada, in terms of rights, there are, as I mentioned, five distinct treaties out there, each of which have five different set of corresponding obligations. Um, we should expect that, as in Canada, there's a rich tapestry of indigenous peoples with multiple different ways of expressing and implementing indigenous rights, and so too is the case internationally. The implication for that is that the declaration by necessity is drafted in um, less than completely crystal clear terms, like they're not easily implementable standards because one has to actually translate those standards to the context of a specific country or a specific indigenous people. The same would be true for the sustainable development goals and that's one of the big chunks of work that um, I join my colleagues in um, expressing concerns about decision making because it's really challenging to capture that diversity without having indigenous peoples involved and included throughout. But I do, I cite that as a challenge for implementation, as I cite rights as a challenge for implementation. But I also um, caution all here that those are also both really tremendous opportunities to accrue better understanding of the declaration and the sustainable development goals, both between indigenous peoples, nation states, and other actors, but also between and among indigenous peoples themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> a lot of great information and insights. So now I'm going to turn to my second question. <clears throat> and just keeping an eye on the time and wanting to make sure we leave a nice robust amount of time for the audience to pick the brains of these panelists, I'm going to ask each of you to try and keep your answer to be around three or four minutes. <laughs> So the second question, and I, I believe that we've got a few nuggets of answers from your first from your first answer. So maybe just highlighting them a little bit more for us. How can collaboration be strengthened to ensure that development and development initiatives are aligned with UNDRIP? And we're going to start again with you, Mike. All right. Um, thanks. And uh, I'll, I have my stopwatch for the three to four minute uh, limit there. So I'll be brief. Um, I think the, obviously the collaboration uh, piece is key. And what does collaboration mean? Well, intrinsic in collaboration is being present, right? And being included, not just included, because inclusion implies an act by someone else. Our, our, our inherent right to be present as an equal party with Canada. And I want to pick up in this answer what Brandon had mentioned around being present in international fora and having standing within the UN system. 
Um, and I know the action plan isn't the be all and end all of everything, but there's a lot there and a lot of promise if it's leveraged and implemented well. And one of those articles, uh, sorry, those action plan measures, action plan measure 72, which ITK uh, took the lead in negotiating and was also uh, adopted by Métis Nation in the shared priorities section of the action plan. And it talks about Canada's committing to work uh, and enhance the participation of Indigenous peoples in decision makings on matters which affect them um, in advancing Canada's contribution to the work of the entities in the UN system. Okay, there's a lot there. All right. What does that mean? And I think that's part of deciphering the action plan in its implementation. Because yes, it was a negotiated document, as Will mentioned, perhaps some of the terms are intentionally ambiguous or, you know, best we could agree to. But then there's an opportunity in that too, for us to really implement an agenda and put meaning to those words that they haven't had in the past or the meanings that work, as Brendan was saying, at the local level in the lives of Métis people. So I would submit that given Action Plan Measure uh, 72, at a minimum, this would be a requirement for Canada, and since we're at Métis National Council, I'll say Métis, to include Métis government representation on delegations to UN, not just UN fora, within the UN system, and UN negotiating meetings. Um, my former life, was at uh, Foreign Affairs Canada, I guess GAC, as it's now known. Um, so I know the value, again, of being present, and more so, the standard that's reinforced by absence. Right? And as equal parties, again, we go back to that, and I'm glad that the PBM adopted the um, co-development principles earlier this month that use the term equal parties. It's a lot again in there to leverage, to leverage, especially around cabinet confidence, but I'm not, I promised I wouldn't you know, bring that up here. Um, so to conclude, that would be inclusion under Action Plan Measure 72 as it gets negotiated down into real life of Métis governments on Canada's delegations to UN fora and meetings, in addition to any self-determined Métis government participation and or attendance. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll pass it to you, Brandon. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'd make two points here. The first is know the tools that are at your disposal and understand how to use them most effectively um, through the international um, aspect of implementing the SDGs. Um, I think that I think that falls to what Mike was saying about enhanced participation in the UN system itself as Indigenous peoples. Um, I was able to be on some of the calls years ago with, with Kenneth Deere and some of the other experts on this, and, and I know there's a lot of really thoughtful work going on and, on how to, how to understand the UN system and to use it most effectively for um, gaining an appropriate standing, I would say, for, for Indigenous governments and nations. Um, in Canada, I think we have a really useful tool in the federal UNDRIP Act. Um, I was really interested to hear David Lametti's comments yesterday on this, and particularly on Section 5 of that Act, which, um, speaking only for myself here, but I really believe gives Indigenous peoples a procedural avenue that's very potentially very powerful that we never had before, um, and placing a corresponding duty on, on the federal government and government officials when they take certain actions um, that we can really use in ways that we haven't been able to do to get into rooms to make decisions that we haven't been able to make before as Indigenous peoples. Um, just as an aside, it was it was kind of bewildering to me throughout the action plan process, speaking to people who were otherwise very well versed in Aboriginal law, for example, who had a, had challenges, I think, contemplating the potential of Section 5 of that act in particular and what it meant for Indigenous peoples. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done to, to lay the groundwork to make I guess to prepare the most fulsome application of that act and that provision in that act in particular, I think I think can go a long way in, in strengthening collaboration um, as a matter of right and as a matter of law. Uh, so I think that's that's kind of the first broad point. The second broad point is something that I think underscores everything that's being talked about at this event um, and with the SDGs in particular. And I would make the case that in order to effectively implement these goals or to realize these goals in, to any practical effect, it requires the, the, the implementation of UNDRIP, it requires 
the alignment with Hundrip um, at a minimum, I think. And there's, I think there's two ways to look at, at why that is. The first is looking at the goals themselves. They're, they're broad in scope, they're indivisible, they're all integrated, and our constitution in Canada simply isn't built like that. Um, it's built into silos, it's built into what used to be called watertight compartments, but now no longer is. But, but that's kind of the, the feeling is that authorities and jurisdictions are apportioned uh, differently and that, that makes the implementation of broad indivisible goals um, quite challenging, I think. Um, I think there's a very particular and specialized place for Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights to solve for that problem. And I'd point to the decision of a couple of weeks ago by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in the Quebec reference for the Child and Family Services Act, uh, where the Supreme Court affirms a very broad application of, of the federal power in Section 9124, uh, dealing with Indigenous peoples, um, and how that can how that can be a bridge to this um, this division of powers between provinces and then the feds. I think when you bring in indigenous peoples, when you realize how all these things affect indigenous rights, I think it, it, it opens up avenues in constitutional law that wouldn't otherwise be in there. Um, the court quote included a really interesting quote by Professor Peter Hogg to the effect of, I'm gonna paraphrase, but the court effectively said, there is no, if section 9124 of the, the federal powers of the constitution only allows them to make laws for indigenous peoples that they can make for everyone else, there would be no need for it. Um, which I would contend implies that there's kind of this distinct and unique way that the federal government can act uh, in regard in relation to indigenous peoples. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's kind of the effective avenue that we have to implement these goals. And it's through the implementation of indigenous rights. Uh, the second kind of broader point uh, I would make to that is that what I was saying before, um, there's an economist called Friedrich Hayek who, who talks about the local knowledge problem, which is what I was um, mentioning before, which is to effectively implement these broad-based things, you need to incorporate the special knowledge that people have um, on the ground in local conditions for special circumstances. And if you think of Indigenous peoples over many, many generations, um, accruing, maintaining, and developing knowledge about resources, about land, about relationships, and so on, um, that need, the effectiveness and the success of these goals depends on the effective incorporation of that knowledge. Uh, and that's to be done through, for example, Articles 18, 19, and 32 of the UN Declaration, which affirm our right to make those decisions to apply that knowledge um, before actions can be taken. And I think that's, that's the pathway to success. That's how you strengthen collaboration, I think. Um, and I think, I think all of this depends on doing that. It's, it's not supplemental. It's not optional and it's not uh, a bonus. It, it's a core part of the project. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you. Um, so just reflecting on the question again, how can collaboration be strengthened? Um, I think the biggest thing for those spaces is to bring um, a decolonial lens. These spaces and these tables um, where this work is occurring between the governments in power and indigenous nations, um, indigenous governments, indigenous groups, um, it, we have to have a decolonial lens. Um, it's so common to still have an experience colonial rhetoric at these tables. Um, I was negotiating some pieces with a director level staff uh, with the government of Canada the other day. This is just the other day, this was last week. Um, and the short story is essentially, they, they said, well, you have everything you need. <laughs> it wasn't a negotiation, it was, it was them shutting it down, saying you have, like, very condescending, you have everything you need. Um, so, of course, I opened up with some responses on how we need to de decolonize this table, uh, which was a happy Monday for him. But, um, <laughs> but uh, we, we, you know, there's, there's good faith from Canada. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Canada, so I'm, I'm going to focus a lot on Canada. Um, we're, we're, there's good faith from Canada coming forward with, with the action plan. Um, but now we have to all come in, to the table 
um, with the power dynamic and, and the ego and the fear, we have to let those go. Uh, this is not clean work. This is hard work. It's going to be messy. We're going to have to debate. We're going to have to have tough negotiations. So let's get the right people at the table to do the messy, hard work. Let's not be scared of it. Um, let's not be scared that, you know, uh, one nation getting something is going to trigger the anger of another nation. Let's not be scared of that. Let's get to the table. Let's do the work. Let's bring the right people to the table. Um, we, we can't have fear. We really see that a lot. Um, uh, we see that a lot, especially in, from the uh, MNBC perspective. Um, we see, we see uh, the continued um, fight for um, to be self-government, to be self-determined, to be recognized by Canada. We already know um, we are the elected government of over 25,000 uh, citizens in BC. Um, uh, but that recognition uh, from Canada um, uh, opens up further avenues for us to sit at particular tables so that we can actually work on the action plan. Um, Bill C-53, which I know some folks have talked about um, over the past couple days, um, is supporting that recognition for um, Métis Nation Alberta, Métis Nation Saskatchewan, Métis Nation Ontario, but uh, Métis Nation British Columbia um, was left out of that, and there's still not recognition from Canada, um, and that's something we continually fight for. Um, so that really, in, in terms of collaboration, um, and go with Canada, but also from a global perspective. Um, the, the Western colonial governments in power, in, in, or, in order to really have true collaboration, uh, must recognize the self-determination and inherent rights of Indigenous groups, and just must stop questioning those and asking for evidence. There, there has to be a level of letting go of the ego, letting go of the power, and accepting that recognition, and getting the work done. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Passing it over to you, Will, speaking on how collaboration can be strengthened. Um, okay, um, my thoughts on this are going to be a bit uh, of a mess and all over the place, so apologies in advance. Um, but um, picking up where I left off, I think one really powerful point for collaboration is recognition of diversity in terms of who um, who some of your counterparties or some of our counterparties may be. Um, so for, for ITK, naturally we are very uh, aware of um, the diversity in and amongst Inuit in Canada as well as internationally. Um, it's helpful for others to be um, as aware as possible of, of how Inuit institutions work and are working with us. Um, and I really appreciate um, specifically MNC for taking the time um, and being patient um, as we basically walk through some of that. As a, an example, just on enhanced participation, it's challenging for ITK to, to comment too deeply on that, partially because we have colleagues from ICC Canada and ICC International that also track that issue um, as basically the representative institution on, on international issues. Um, it's... Uh, also important, by the way, to recognize diversity within governments and governments themselves. So that's uh, groups of states within the UN, um, as well as groups subnationally within the government of Canada. Um, it's, it's really important to not treat and not think of the government as a, as a monolithic uh, entity um, and to really recognize uh, some of the diversity that, that's out there. Um, and to respect that diversity in terms of both how you like practically structure work, um, so people like me don't always answer the phone quickly, but also, and perhaps more importantly for someone like myself, crafting substantive positions. So that's one of the reasons which gets to the second point, which I had talked earlier about in terms of rights. Um, one of the reasons why ITK um, and, and MNC have been advancing the idea of an Indigenous Peoples Human Rights Tribunal from ITK's perspective is because a lot of the economic, social, and cultural rights were not on the table when Inuit modern treaties were negotiated with Canada. And those rights are um, plastered all over the Declaration and are heavily implicated in the goals. Um, so in recognition of the diversity, it really is a matter of trying to find those areas of commonality where we think that we can work together um, to advance common interests, as well as to engage in a, in a fairly healthy give and take. And, and again, um, really, really appreciate the contributions of, of MNC 
in a lot of that work because it's really informed a lot of a lot of our thinking in terms of how best to pursue um, that, as well as as Brandon mentioned, some of the other levers that are that are readily available um, for for use in terms of assisting implementation from more of a rights perspective. The third point that I would make is about um, compromise, uh, and it's just uh, or time. Um, and it is noting that a lot of the rights that I would be most interested in uh, with respect to sustainable development goals and a declaration are, are economic, social, and cultural rights, mm -hmm. um, which probably would best be implemented through concepts of progressive realization. In other words, you can't expect immediate implementation right out of the, the gate and how to balance concepts of progressive realization against the incredible um, and devastating um, socioeconomic gaps faced by indigenous peoples in Canada and other countries is really hard work. It takes a lot of courage to engage in that kind of discussion. One of the reasons I really like working for, for Inuit treaty organizations is that our, our presidents and senior technical staff and lawyers are, are really fearless um, in terms of the ability to engage in incremental and longer term planning. Um, I would also suggest that it's also very scary for, for public governments, the United Nations, um, and national governments like the Government of Canada to engage in those kinds of discussions because they are by their very nature disruptive. But I think that one of the only ways to, to really work effectively together is to demonstrate that level of, of courage um, and patience in terms of the incremental progress um, that we need when we need incremental pro pro progress while recognizing that there are points in time when indigenous peoples can be aggressive about seeking very, very rapid change. And it's a matter of being able to capitalize on the rapid change when we can because we already have good working relationships together um, as well as being able to work on those increments in, in again, a relatively fearless and, and patient way. Um, so I mean, that's just my, uh, my two cents on, on that, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much to all the panelists for your insightful answers. And now we do have 15 minutes left for some questions here from the audience. So I'll actually walk the mic over to you. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, uh, my question is around, so right now we have a cooperative government and lots of us are going to, you know, different consultations with different government departments who are asking us what do we think and uh, how can we help them change their practices. But I wanted to ask about um, if there's a change in government, just uh, the, the nature of the legislation that we have. Uh, how bound is a government by the legislation? Would they be able to just defund it and say it's a question of fiscal constraints? Um, is it... Um, is there room in the legislation for them to reinterpret? Uh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So yeah, I'll ask you to self-organize. If you do have a mic, then go ahead and pick it up and you can take it away, Will. Yeah, I'll, I'll launch on it, I guess. Uh, um, for my part, the, the act is the law. One of the reasons why I'm so focused on rights and rights-based discourse, constitutional rights, international fundamental rights, is that it's not something that's eagerly, easily swayed by political considerations. That's the reason why that, that discourse is, is important. SDGs are a good example of something that's left to discretion. Even a friendly government can interpret them how they want. Rights serve to limit the discretion of government to do that. Um, so I can say for my part, that's one of the reasons why the, the struggle for, for rights and for recognition of rights and locking in the understanding as rights is so critical is to ensure some degree of, of robustness um, to political change either between governments or even like within governments. Um, so that's, uh, um, that's point one and then point two is just my, my earlier points about implementation being a struggle is that there's some element of this that's just a reality that, that you can't get away from in the sense that governments will always attempt a, a, or succeed in, in attempting to reinterpret legal instruments. The challenge for indigenous peoples is how to react to those, to those movements from government. Did, okay, Brandon wants to comment on that 
Great question. Yeah, no, really interesting question. Um, and I'll preface this by saying these are really only my personal musings uh, and, and nothing more than that. But um, yes, Parliament can always um, re-legislate or, or take steps to alter. Um, but I think there are two things that, potentially three things that weigh in our favor here. Um, I was really interested to hear the comments by David Lemay again yesterday about the status of, of the federal underpact and, and how it, it may be of such a character that it's of a, of a higher status than just regular legislation. Um, he didn't say the words quasi-constitutional, but um, that's typically how those things are described. And, and so I think that, at least in, in the court of public opinion, carries weight if you're going to alter something. Um, two more points. One is the act itself contains really key phrases that are taken directly from the declaration. And so if you're going to interpret what those phrases mean, um, particularly how, how they affect our relationship with the government of Canada, um, there's very strong guidance in how Canadian law has interpreted direct phrasing from international instruments uh, and how the UN itself has defined some of these terms that I think constrain a little bit the wiggle room for, for defining some of these things down. Uh, and the last point I'll make is that there's been some really interesting legal developments lately about how, how Canada funds the commitments that it makes. Um, and to the extent, to the extent to which its, its internal processes and its funding processes can defund something or fund something below the level in which it requires to be practically implemented. Um, and so we do have a certain recourse, I think, in, in how this thing is, is funded in order to implement it. Um, and maybe I'll stop there before I go into any more detail, but um, I, I do think that I do think that we do have tools available to us and there are certain positions we can fall back on and, and safeguards within the act itself. Uh, so thank you. Go ahead. Sure, just briefly, um, and thanks for that excellent question. Um, bluntly, governments can amend and repeal any legislation they want. And in our, in our system, we have uh, you know, majority governments, uh, possibly as majority governments. And so, you know, as Will said, legislation is not protected with any status except the will of the government of the day. What we did do was say some rights are so important, so fundamental to our identity that we're gonna put them in the charter and give them constitutional status. Anyone remember how easy it is to amend the, the constitution, right? Yeah, um, so that's why they have that status. Uh, there was a bill of rights, as you know, but again, it could be amended government to government. Um, I think we have to look too at not just the legislative arena, but how the political level in a change of government acts to instruct and direct the public service, all right? Um, and that is a, a, a big deal in terms of how we can advance our agenda. Um, and if laws are being repealed or, or amended, kind of the juggernaut is where, does, where do we go for redress? And Brandon and Will just mentioned some strategies other than courts, but again, that's Canada's courts, deciding interests of, you know, issues of Métis rights and interests. Um, and so to me, I'd just like to add to that uh, toolbox, and if, we if we have to go there, you know, I think the power lies in our ability of our Métis leadership and Métis citizens then to organize and build power um, and be able to take on, if we have to, amendments or the repeal of legislation that, in our view, is unacceptable. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Melanie, something to add? I, can, I was just going to speak to the interpretation aspect of your question. Um, I consistently see interpretation of law as, as a, a challenge in the work of, in, of fighting for, advocating for Indigenous rights. Um, I've been at multiple tables where you're like, oh, this conversation's gonna go well, this is in the act, you're reading it, you're prepping, you meet with, with whomever you're meeting with, stakeholder or government, um, and, and the interpretation is so different, it becomes quite a negotiation and, and a debate. Um, it, and then when you're writing policy or writing law, you, you and, and the folks who have been on the other side of those challenges are helping to write it, you see that 
play out in the, the micro detail. Um, it's, it's kind of like, I'd use these really bad examples of, you know, the, why the McDonald's coffee says caution hot because somebody put it on their leg, burnt themselves, and legal now says, you know, it's caution hot, or there's those big buckets you see in the kitchen store, and they say, there's a picture of a baby, and it says no baby, because someone unfortunately put their baby in, and yeah, so it's, it's these experiences, like when you see all these details, and sometimes we have to fight for that as part of the negotiation of like, uh, we'll be working with Canada, saying a law, and it's like, well, why do we have to go to so much detail? Well, because every single detail we're fighting for is an ex it's a, a lived experience of the, a past table, a previous table, um, where, where we didn't add that, and then the interpretation was a loss of an indigenous right at a, at a table. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, well, just want to start by saying thank you, merci, that this has been so interesting, and um, yeah, I wrote so much down, but I'll, I've worked a lot in the UN system, and uh, yeah, all of your insights are <laughs> paying on <laughs> in terms of <laughs> the complexity and challenges of uh, this global system, but unfortunately, it's the only meeting space we currently have globally, right? So I guess I'm taking this conversation a little bit globally, and I'm curious to know um, you mentioned, you know, the only seats at the table are member states. So how do you foresee Indigenous voices on these international forums? I think this Global Summit for MNC really showcases an interest in participating in those voices. Um, Melanie, I'd be curious with your UN experience too, like to hear about, but more specifically, and just looking at other inspirations, like Australia launched the Australian government and indigenous diplomacy agenda. What does that look like for ITK? What does that look like for MNC or the Assembly of First Nations? Like how do we ensure or, or get a seat or create a seat or create your own forum or international fora um, to have these conversations on the global level? Um, and yes, they are aspirational. The only, the only thing that I find inspiring is that they're all built on consens consensus, which people don't really realize how you know, challenging it is to get like 284 countries to agree on anything. Um, <laughs> but, but then like the, the, uh, a lot of your points are it's all in the details, right, of implementing that. And what does that mean? And Brendan, you made a really good point about like how do you bring that down to community level and then connect and use for those rights. So I guess, yeah, grasping that right in Canada and then internationally fighting for that as well. Thank you. So Melanie, actually, can you start for that since she did mention you? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I don't have a direct answer. <laughs> I, I can't solve that problem. I'd love to just sit here and say that it could be solved. Um, I think uh, when, when you were asking the question, one thing that came to mind for me was um, with, within these mechanisms such as the UN, I think there needs to be a strong educational aspect of Indigenous rights. Um, so for example, when I was working on the Indigenous Land Titling Project in Guyana. I was a consultant for UNDP, um, and so we were working more from a SDG or UNDP perspective, um, and I was talking about UNDRIP, and Guyana is a signatory to UNDRIP, and yet the uh, UNDP staff at, the, at that office, they there was no understanding or education of UNDRIP. It was like, what is that? And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, and these, these were UN staff within a UNDP office, and not to throw them like under the bus, but um, I, I was, it was a concern. Um, and so, you know, and, and this, this is still, I'm kind of answering it within the mechanisms that I just kind of argued about, so, but just in terms of something off the top of my head, I, I do think there needs to be um, more education within all of these spaces um, so that we can create the spaces and then potentially for folks to, you know, and some folks might find this controversial, but for, for other folks to get out of the way to create spaces for Indigenous people to come into the space. Um, that's a bit of an ego power dynamic and 
uh, that's a tough one to change, but it's really something that needs to happen, I think. Thank you. I am looking at the time, and we're, we are at time now. Can but I just I, say one thing, actually? Yeah, that there, um, come to the next session on enhanced participation. Apparently, you're going to talk about exactly that. I just had a brainwave, a thought just come to me. So thank you. Excellent. So with that, I will thank our panelists again for sharing your expertise and your wealth of knowledge and experience with us today. And thank everyone in the room for your beautiful presence and participation. And we'll see you back in the main room. Thank you.